So uh, welcome to the very first lecture of this uh, series. I'm Alessandro Di Renzo, one of the curators, together with uh, Costanza Lucarini, Saskia Gribling, and Elena Giaccone. Other uh, curators are online. So just very quick reminders for the students who are attending the lectures for the credits. And then I will leave the floor to Professor Calder and the discussant. So we have the, the papers to sign when you enter the classroom so we can check your presence. Who is attending on Zoom? Uh, we are checking using Zoom, so you don't need to, you don't need to sign, of course. Uh, another information is that we moved the date of the 28th March to uh, the 10th of May. There is the, on the website, there is the updated program and in the shared folder, we also updated the working groups. So you can check directly in the, in the shared folder. Then I just wanted to remind you that Saturday, there is the deadline for the assignment for Sumaya Valley. And now I can leave the floor to the discussants who are uh, Professor Filippo de, Filippo de Pieri and Professor Sergio Pace, also Vilma Fasoli. Yes, is connected. So please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to you all. Uh, thank you to Barnabas Calder, uh, who accepted our invitation. Thank you to Filippo and Vilma. Uh, it is with really deep, great pleasure that I introduce Panavas Calder in this lecture. Uh, and I also would like to thank uh, uh, all, the, all the students from Mind the Gap for including uh, this conference in the ACC lectures. Uh, I think it is a very, very important event for all of us. Uh, and I mean this for the, the whole School of Architecture of the Polytechnic. In fact, with Vilma Fasoli and Filippo De Pieri, two weeks ago, we started our very first classes in environmental history of architecture, storia ambientale dell'architettura. It has been a difficult choice, a very difficult choice, being the outcome of an intense debate among the architectural historians in our department. But it was a choice in which, however, we we, we have strongly believed since the beginning. While, in fact, while environmental history has been discussed for decades in the world, and for some years with excellent results in Italy too, an architectural history with the environment in all its broadest meanings and its resources as a privileged point of view point of observation has not yet been fully attempted in our schools. We have been prompted to undertake this task also because the volume by Barnabas Calder, uh, which you see here in the, in, the, in the slide, Architecture from Prehistory to Climate Emergency, published in uh, 2020, 2021, has contributed to clarify the terms of the question and moreover, its potential for further growth. Uh, let me say, it is indisputable. All of us are and remain, first and foremost, historians. Our objects of study are and remain the architecture and the city. Our outlook, however, can be responsive to the present and it must mutate whenever the present requires us to reflect on previously little explored themes. Therefore, Thanks to Barnabas for giving us this opportunity. And Filippo, you have the floor. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, I don't want to steal time from the presentation for and from the presentation and discussion. Uh, I also want to thank Barnabas for being with us today and the organizers for including this lecture in the, as the opening lecture of the program, actually. So my task now is just to uh, present Barnabas to our audience. Barnabas is an architectural historian uh, teaching at the University of Liverpool, uh, where he heads the Architectural and Urban History Group. Um, he has uh, uh, numerous fields of specialization, actually. He is also, among other things, 
uh, especially of a specialist of British post-war architecture. Uh, he worked extensively on Dennis Lasdon. Uh, he wrote a few years ago in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, a book called Raw Concrete on the History of Brutalism. But we are here today to discuss his new endeavor, which is the book you already saw in the slides, which I have here to, to give you evidence that physical copies of the book actually exist. Uh, it is a book that currently existing as a hardback uh, edition, but the paperback edition is on its way. Uh, and uh, an Italian translation is also uh, on its way. And uh, Barnabas has accepted to present some of the hypotheses behind the book uh, for this uh, very important opening lecture today. Thank you, Barnabas. Thank you. Form follows fuel. Energy, our food and our fuel, energy has always been the single biggest factor in shaping all human affairs. Energy has shaped the built environment above all things with architecture's exorbitant energy demands for obtaining and deploying materials and for keeping people warm in cold places. Today's dominant energy source, the burning of fossil fuels, has already pushed large areas of the world towards ecological collapse. And things are likely to get much worse if we don't achieve an energy revolution fast. That's the context in which we meet today. And I would like to thank you all enormously, particularly, obviously, Sergio and Filippo for the invitation. Uh, and for uh, coming to listen today. I'd like to use the chance of discussing this with you to make my case for an approach to architectural history that I think gets to the heart of understanding and acting on the great crisis of our age, the climate emergency. There can be no higher priority in all human affairs than radically reducing our emissions. Yet greenwashing and self-deception, backed by feeble or dishonest environmental assessment systems, fuzzy thinking and misunderstanding allow developers, construction companies, and almost all of the building sector to continue with profitable but ecologically devastating business as usual. Despite decades of talk about sustainability, and much excellent research, the construction and operation of buildings is still responsible for 39% of all anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Much the largest source of climate change emissions, around 60%, is the burning of fossil fuels as an energy source. We require a massive energy transition to minimize climate catastrophe and energy needs to be the central concern of architecture now. So what I offer anyone pursuing practice or research in architecture is a simple question that I believe could enrich everyone's research and thinking and help to tie it into the great concern of our age. And you can ask it of almost anything. My question is, how does this relate to energy systems? It's superficially a modest question, perhaps even unattractively technical and dull sounding. But when you apply it constantly to the past, to the present, and to the future, it opens up a new understanding of the world. Nor is this an anachronistic projection of a contemporary concern backwards into earlier periods. Energy has always been the single biggest influence on architecture throughout its entire history. Earlier societies may not have theorized all energy's different forms as a single phenomenon, but equally they did not theorize gravity in the way we do, but their architecture was totally shaped by both energy and gravity, however they themselves understood those universals. Early in the 20th century, 
energy defined in utilitarian fashion by scientists and engineers as the capacity for doing work came to be understood as the common factor that unified all the sciences. My contention is that in our century, the arts and humanities should also embrace the explanatory power of energy to reinterpret our fields. My book is a first outline attempt to answer this central question, how does this relate to energy systems? Across a range of architectural case studies around the globe, over the past 14,000 years. This is a big sweep of history to try and encompass in one book, but we can only understand the all-encompassing global challenge of today's climate emergency by investigating the physics and economics of how we got here. You see the great changes in energy systems, not in the tight frame of one city or one nation during one or two decades, but in the long sweep of history. It's when you compare today's energy systems to ancient ones that you recognize most clearly the spectacularly anomalous nature of almost all architecture today, shaped as it still overwhelmingly is by modernist practices and theories. Accordingly, my book is organized around the three main categories into which energy historians divide human energy systems, hunter-gatherer, agrarian, and fossil fuel. Hunter-gatherer energy systems, past and present, are enormously diverse, characterized typically by groups optimizing their environment to streamline their harvest of naturally occurring energy, food and fire fuel. Hunter-gatherer groups architecture is generally like everything else in their lives, closely related to their energy systems. Groups who move around a lot in pursuit of seasonal foods build quickly and simply, if at all. Hunter-gatherers who tackle the coldest environments like the mammoth hunters who braved the ice age landscape of what's now the Ukraine 14,000 years ago, have to invest more time and more calories in building weatherproof, robust homes. This is perhaps the earliest known building. And it makes the link between energy systems and architecture strikingly, inescapably clear. It is built of food energy waste, mammoth bone and reindeer hide. Form follows fuel. It was even heated by burning mammoth bones as fuel, which must have smelt terrible. But in cases where humanity has chosen between poor air quality and unendurable cold, we have always chosen poor air quality. Hunter-gatherer's architecture is rarely profligate its designers and builders understanding the energy cost far more intuitively than we do because they procured the materials and assembled them by the work of their own muscles, work that could otherwise be invested in food production or simply replaced with pleasanter activities. The enormously diverse energy systems we lump together as hunter-gatherer supported hominins from several million years ago through the evolution of anatomically modern humans around 200,000 years ago and on to the present. Despite increasingly ubiquitous, aggressive marginalization and oppression by agrarian and fossil fuel states over the past six millennia. Most of what gets discussed in architectural history surveys is crushed into the few millennia since the advent of the first agrarian states. Well, excuse me, my daughter is ill at home today. I'm just going to see what she wants. Hello, kind of weird. Sorry. Uh, my daughter uh, 
started her day by walking into our room and um, poor thing vomiting uh, onto our bed. So <laughs> poor, poor little thing. <laughs> what, not what, what a beginning. <laughs> poor girl and poor you. Yeah. Well, she's doing fine, but she's just feeling a bit sad. Sorry about the interruption. Um, yes, most of what gets discussed in architectural history surveys is crushed into the few millennia since the advent of agrarian states, which arose around 6,000 years ago, exploiting new niches created by a series of domestications of cereal crops and animals where hunter-gatherer energy systems typically aimed to optimize energy harvest per person, rapacious expansionistic agrarian states instead sought to maximize energy produced per unit of land, downgrading most people and domesticated animals into tools to shape increasing proportion of the earth's land mass to privilege the staple grasses like rice, maize, barley, and millet, and trees for firewood. These new systems could support much denser populations, several hundred times more pop people per hectare than in typical modern day hunter-gatherer contexts. And this storable, easy to tax supply of crops, which farmers could produce on fertile land, supported a small, very steep hierarchy of rulers and religious leaders and populations of city dwellers who could specialize in things other than energy production. Form follows fuel, and a new energy system brings new architecture. In this case, the monumental mega projects of the agrarian elite. 80 to 95% of the population of most agrarian states worked unpleasantly hard in the fields, living in poverty with a narrow, unhealthy diet to support this non-farming minority whose artifacts and buildings and literature make up the historical record. Most of the first half of my book looks at the architectural outputs of these sorts of societies and how differences in the details of their energy systems produce differences in cultural and architectural outputs. I trace the outburst of creativity and efficient systematization that arose from the enormous urban boom of Song Dynasty China, following a change in rice variety that almost doubled their rice harvest from one year to the next. This is the Iron Pagoda at Kaifeng, shown to the same scale as the Mammoth Bone House, to give a sense of the sheer size of agrarian monuments relative to most hunter-gatherer buildings. I examine similar structures in the construction industry of Imperial Rome during its climate optimum and the urban boom that came with its peak grain importation from Egypt. I investigate the immense scale of the pyramids of Giza, Khufu's pyramid here shown to the same scale once again. At least since Herodotus, the pyramids have been presented as the products of destructive megalomania. Yet my question, how does this relate to energy systems, suggests a different reading. Construction on this scale probably had a functional dimension in disposing of enormous seasonal surpluses of human muscle power, which left to its own devices could have become a threat to the regime. People working hard on a highly organized project are kept busy, fit, and subordinated. Agrarian architecture beyond the humble homes of the farming majority was shaped by twin realities. Labor was, for the powerful who controlled the food surplus, consistently very cheap indeed. From 1800 BCE to 1300 CE, across a wide range of agrarian societies, Walter Scheidel has shown that the overwhelming majority saw rates of pay for unskilled laborers hovering around the subsistence level where a worker's daily pay could feed the worker, but to support a partner and children, other family members would often have to supplement the food income. At these prices, Song, Roman or Egyptian rulers or French cathedral chapters could afford a very great deal of labor 
and their buildings show it. Form follows fuel. But all this labor is of limited use. Human muscles are pathetically weak. The 78 million days of labor that one academic estimates it took to build the pyramid of Khufu equate in terms of modern energy use to less than the lifetime energy consumption of just seven average Americans today. In other words, an average contemporary extended family in North America, Europe, or Australasia controls energy resources equivalent to the handful of most powerful rulers of the ancient world. What was not cheap, even for the very powerful in history's farming economies, was heat. Industry, cooking, and heating all needed to be served by slow-growing firewood, supplemented in poorer domestic contact effects by burning other plant matter and animal dung. Cooking has always been non-negotiable even for the poor. Humans can't survive long-term on raw food only. The firewood that was grown to meet these needs typically took up land that could otherwise be used for food, and the result was that firewood was almost always scarce and expensive. As far north as London, for instance, a medieval city of 10,000 people required 10,000 hectares of firewood coppicing to meet its heat demands. With poor roads worse in winter, transporting enough wood placed an effective limit on the size of medieval cities in colder places. Energy historians describe this and other agrarian economic limitations as the photosynthetic constraint. The concept describes an upper limit on the energy available to agrarian societies set by the amount of energy their crops and trees could harness from the sun annually. This had immense implications for their economies and architecture. If you think about an industry like glass making or iron making, we are familiar with the modern pattern that the more of it you do, the cheaper it gets. Within the photosynthetic constraint, the growth of the industry put pressure on firewood supplies and drove up prices until the product itself became even more expensive. Such restraints limited growth across the economy. The architectural implication can be seen here. Even one of the richest families in an area of Britain in the 16th century, deliberately showing off their wealth through abundant windows, could only get this quality of glass because wood had to be burnt to make it. The wonderful traditions of medieval Cairo's mosque lamps or the Ile de France's uh, ecclesiastical windows are even more impressive than we conventionally acknowledge in the face of the photosynthetic constraint. The mystery factor that has driven the extraordinary economic growth of recent centuries has been fossil fuels, where the more you extract, the more you can invest in extracting more. And all the industries dependent on them can profit from ever dropping costs and ever more powerful energy services. The cost of lighting per lumen dropped by a factor of 14,000 between 1200 and 2000 in the UK, in England, 14,000 times cheaper to light your evening's reading. The implications of fossil fuels for architecture are immense. We routinely use levels of energy for building materials that the world could not possibly have afforded in an agrarian energy system. To sustainably furnish the world's current energy consumption for cement production alone, using the dominant agrarian source of intense heat, charcoal, would require the entire output of an area of coppiced woodland larger than Australia. Express that same amount of energy as human labor and it gets even more absurd. To, to furnish the same amount of useful energy annually, 
would require an enormous group of healthy adults working eight hours a day, six days a week, every week of the year. A group, in fact, 4.7 times larger than today's entire human population. Just for the energy we put into cement production, steel would add more than the same again. Aluminium, plastics and glass would continue to multiply this figure up to an impossible army of people. In these circumstances, whilst the social injustice of the agrarian world is repulsive, its self-restraint on heat inputs in architecture is hugely cheering as we seek to escape our dependency on fossil fuels. The vast baths of Caracalla, shown here again for the same scale as the Pyramid of Khufu, they still tower over a, a large area of central Rome despite almost two millennia of spoliation. This astounding solidity was achieved using very modest heat inputs and materials sourced impressively locally. 76% of the volume of materials in this building was extracted within 20 kilometers of the site and under 6% of the volume was made up of the two materials that required heat to make, brick and lime. The statistics are from Janet Delane's extraordinary reverse quantity surveying job on this building. Today's buildings, by contrast, are almost entirely composed of materials requiring huge heat inputs and transported around the planet using addictively cheap diesel. Form follows fuel. So fossil fuels changed everything. And half of my book is devoted to the few centuries in which they have come to transform the world. Our long dependency on them makes us blind to their ubiquity in our built environment. Britain has been dependent on fossil energy since the 17th century, when coal produced the Georgian house. Coal-fired brick walls, coal-made glass for those lovely big windows, and coal forged iron building tools, nails, hinges, and so on. These were genuine improvements, big enough to make it worth coping with the growing pollution of coal smoke that Elizabeth McKellar describes so fascinatingly. With fossil fuels, heat became vastly cheaper. And with the steam engine, that heat that cheap, cheap heat could be used to replace muscle power for an increasing range of tasks in transport, manufacturing, and even from the 1850s, some aspects of construction labor as labor costs rose with material living standards. The long-standing agrarian pattern that labor was cheap, heat expensive, was dramatically reversed by coal, radically changing the materials, construction practices, and operation of buildings. The total amount of energy available too was vastly greater. A pre-modern farming family could typically harvest in the region of 1.2 times what they consumed themselves. Victorian coal miners could extract 500 times more energy than they consumed in food. Abundant coal energy magnified everything. Scientific understanding and technological development, growing diffusion of political power in industrializing countries, but also an expanded scale and ambition in imperialism and colonial exploitation, a grotesque magnification in the trade in enslaved people, bigger wars, pollution, and vile industrial slums. Coal energy built British Victorian cities like Liverpool, where I'm speaking from. Coal-fired bricks transported by coal-powered trains joined together with coal-fired mortar lit by coal glass windows by day and coal gas lighting at night. The division that architectural historians sometimes make between Victorian or 19th century and modernist architecture is in energy terms largely false. Victorian and Edwardian buildings explored all the energy hungry materials and services that were to characterize modernism. In Liverpool, we have metal used for entire buildings, 
uh, here St George's Church Everton from 1814, testing out a prefabricated iron frame intended for export to British colonies. Reinforced concrete frame construction a century later um, at the Liver building, uh, testing Enbeek's concrete system and showing it off to American business people passing through the ports to and from Europe. Air conditioning and central heating systems. Here at St. George's Hall opened in 1854, which had a steam engine pumped purified air system and powerful artificial lighting. You also see factory mass production of building components growing and growing. And in a complex interaction with colonialism and the trade in enslaved people, coal promoted Liverpool's fast sprawling city development. I've plotted Liverpool's growth against the energy consumption of England and Wales using beautiful maps drawn from my book by Chris Dove. 440 years after its foundation, Liverpool was barely more than a village. The country's energy consumption is visualized in the red bar on the left, a very modest amount of energy across England and Wales, and still based almost entirely on new grown food and firewood by this date. 75 years later, you can see a slight increase in both the uh, rise of coal and the size of the city, but it's still early days. Another 60 years sees both national energy consumption and city size approximately doubling. And they more than double again after another half century. Here you see that dotted line, the first intercity railway line uh, arriving in the city, connecting Manchester and Liverpool. And with the steam engine and railways, uh, the city explodes in size. Uh, as does the energy consumption, not only for moving locomotives, but also for static steam engines for manufacturing. So what you see in the uh, 60 years to 1896 is a total change in the pace of growth and an enormous change in the amount of energy being pumped into uh, English and Welsh industry and domestic life and transport. Uh, with the 20th century, uh, the speed of growth in Liverpool slackens somewhat, but um, as does the British um, uh, increase in energy consumption, the story moves in particular to America in the first half of the 20th century. The aesthetics of modernism arose from the thrillingly overheated reaction of gifted young people in Italy, the USSR, France and elsewhere to their own country's faster moving second generation fossil fuel revolutions. The beautiful modernist villas of the 1920s and 30s were problematically greenhouse like in hot weather and in winter they were essentially a continuous cold bridge maximizing heat loss through balconies, exposed soffits and roof gardens with single glazed metal framed windows, an integral part of their aesthetic. This is often passed off as an unfortunate side effect of experimental new technologies. But my question, how does this relate to energy systems, again offers a different interpretation. One of the joyous freedoms the early modernists were gleefully exploring was the freedom to heat large uninsulated spaces with powerful fossil fuel boilers. Open plan cubist villas were an elated escape from the age old Northern European tradition of houses that huddled their rooms together around the chimney stack to profit from every jewel of warmth they could conserve, dividing rooms into sealed units small enough to heat with an open fire or stove. Form follows fuel. This freedom hit its most extreme expression in the 1960s, when Cedric Price's high-tech vision, still seen as an inspiring model of flexibility to many architects, proposed to replace constricting conventional enclosures entirely, bringing in instead canvas enclosures warmed by powerful hot air blowers, servicing instead of architecture, seen here from a helicopter, because that's the right way to move around in another deeply energy intensive form of freedom. 
Planning too changed radically with cars and newly affordable construction materials. Le Corbusier and others looked at giant reinforced concrete and glass factories, like the one in which I believe some of you are sitting today, Fiat's Lingotto car plant, with its racetrack on the roof. And Corb and others, Le Corbusier and others, asked why cities should accept the notion of ground level at all. With these new energy hungry materials, concrete, steel and glass, why couldn't roads, pedestrian routes and buildings weave themselves around each other with complete design freedom? At the Barbican in London, 50 years later, they did just this. For the first time in human history, it became common to design interiors where without a constant supply of electricity, to pump in fresh air and keep the lights shining, the audiences of hundreds in these lower spaces in the arts center would over the following hours of complete darkness die of asphyxia. There is no natural way to ventilate and light these spaces. Totally new phenomenon in the history of architecture. The ravenous energy consumption of architecture since the 20th century is not superficial, but fundamental. Asking how does this relate to energy systems shows up modernism as being first and foremost a joyous celebration of fossil fuels. Via modernism, energy profligacy is built deep into the DNA of today's architectural theories and practices. Indeed, modernity itself is arguably the spread of fossil fuel economics and culture around the world. At present, almost all practitioners and educators and the construction industry globally remain trapped squarely within the path dependencies of fossil fuels. Concrete and steel remain ubiquitous default materials despite their catastrophic carbon footprints. Energy hungry services continue to whir in most new buildings and architectural form making continues to prioritize too many other things over operational and embodied carbon. I say this not at all in a spirit of blame. All of humanity is currently snarled up in a fossil fuel world culture, which has brought real benefits as well as real problems. But if we want to reach zero carbon, we must first help our sector face the truth of its current situation. I think we will only achieve the level of change required via very well-crafted and honest regulation. Here again, history can be encouraging. After a millennium and a half of flammable construction in London, this is a surviving street a bit like London's pre-17th uh, um, pre century streets. Uh, this one is in York. After a millennium and a half of this kind of deeply flammable housing, uh, so flammable indeed that um, contracts for properties were often, uh, often included the line that the property line follows the following uh, position on the plan until the first fire, with the assumption being that the buildings would burn down at some point, and then you could redraw the property boundary in a more rational way that would be easier to rebuild on. But they knew that fires were coming to the point it was worth including them in your property contracts. After 1,500 years of having to use these flammable materials because they had uh, easy availability in a low energy context, after the 1666 Great Fire, which destroyed around two thirds of London, there was clear well-enforced regulation brought in on fireproofing and the rebuilt, rebuilt city was constructed with admirable fire protection, uh, avoiding catastrophic fires right through until the late, uh, the early 21st century when deregulation reintroduced catastrophic mass casualty fire. For students and practitioners, if zero carbon threatens our current models and habits, there's something exciting about that too. The great revolutions in form and materials that have developed alongside past energy changes have spawned thrilling opportunities for technical and stylistic innovation. 
for gifted and sincere architects, there is an opportunity to help establish the richest architectural variety and quality ever seen. Each region responding to its climate and its locally available materials as they did before the adoption of fossil fuels, but this time with the extraordinary technical mastery available through contemporary environmental and materials science. I'd like to finish with five suggestions for things that architectural students, practitioners, academics and researchers could potentially uh, take on board in the face of climate emergency. The first would be that I would invite you to consider taking my question today, how does this relate to energy systems? Take that question with you everywhere. Ask it of everything. It opens up a new understanding of the world that is revelatory and urgent. Secondly, I would encourage you to be courageous and ambitious in quantifying aspects of architectural history and architectural practice. Climate change is a quantitative challenge. And to understand it, we need to come to terms with kilowatt hours, with tons of carbon dioxide, and with other measurable things. I haven't found this easy myself. I'm a classic um, uh, uh, British historian that I came down a non-scientific uh, educational route, but I have found it important and worthwhile taking that on. Energy historians and engineers have furnished us with an enormous body of historic and contemporary data and understanding and it shines into the architectural past and present like a searchlight, illuminating it and clarifying it. You have one of the great energy historians uh, um, working in Italy, um, Paolo Malanima. Uh, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with his superb work. Thirdly, and partly related to that previous point, we should be working to develop diverse collaborations internationally. Uh, we should be collaborating between disciplines with engineers, material scientists, re restoration architects, and so on locally to us, and collaborating widely across that borders as well uh, to build the most diverse collaborations we can across the world on the theme of energy and architecture. Only by bringing together the voices of scholars from a diversity of cultures, backgrounds, genders and ethnicities can we establish a worldwide culturally rich picture of the complex entanglements of energy and architecture, of fossil fuels and the global experience of modernity, colonialism, globalization and the struggle for zero carbon and climate justice. Finally, and this is something that in some ways is the easiest one to do from today. The others take time to build, but this one you can do from today. Talk to people outside our discipline. Many architects and engineers long to produce zero carbon buildings and to prioritize retrofit over new build. But to make this a universal reality requires a culture change far beyond the world of architecture itself. We need to do all we can to help politicians, clients and voters to understand what needs to be changed and to lend effective support to the necessary actions. This means spreading understanding in the clearest terms we can to everyone we can reach in a non-adversarial manner, just helping people to see what's going on. You are privileged in Italy to have architecture that a worldwide public is rightly interested in, and you can use this to make a real difference. Through energy history, the profile of your prominent historic buildings can be turned into a potent weapon in the fight for worldwide culture change. Learned conversations behind the paywalls of the academy journals still have their place, but we can make our biggest difference by reaching out to the wider public with a simple, clear, pressing message that zero carbon architecture was normal for most of the past and that its return is not only possible, but vital and urgent. 
We can use history to stiffen our resolve to fight against today's fossil fuel norms and to cheer ourselves with the sustainable past when we are paralyzed by the pessimism born of constant threats of human extinction. We can challenge ourselves and all teaching staff in studio, technology and the profession to push harder for zero carbon solutions. And we can hold our own institutions to account for their own carbon intense building programs and operations. Architecture has a pivotal role in averting catastrophe. Let's not miss our chance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barnabas. It was very, very clear. And uh, I did appreciate a lot how you, you, you managed to sum up such a vast work, uh, e even if the, the book uh, immediately appears already uh, um, uh, uh, a synthesis of an enormous research work. Um, waiting for, I don't know if anybody already asked some, some questions, especially from our students. I always notice that they are always shy with questions. And uh, therefore, probably, uh, I have a couple of curiosity. Uh, uh, first, uh, a curiosity that, uh, well, uh, I was wondering about for uh, for all the time I was reading your book, uh, which uh, we can we could call a, a, a problem of consciousness or a problem of awareness. Mm, while I was reading your pages, I was wondering. Well, obviously not in prehistory, uh, probably not until the contemporary time, but when. When the contemporary age started, we could say, uh, uh, as always, conventionally at the end of the 17th uh, of the 18th century, something like that. I mean, when, when, when you start uh, discussing the contemporary age by means of the uh, fuel fossil fuel revolution, well, my my wonder, my my what I was wondering about is uh, how aware could or can contemporary architects could be of the value acquired by the fossil, uh, uh, fossil fuel revolution in their architecture. I mean, uh, how much could or, or how much they can know or understand or imagine uh, 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 that their architecture was and is conditioned by these energy issues. Uh, Actually, uh, but this is not to, 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 to deny or to reject your thesis, which I do share completely, but actually literature, actually, architectural literature uh, uh, in the 19th century, in the 20th century, well, do not face the problem directly. Uh, if we read uh, the, the super masterpieces from Version Architecture or, uh, I don't know, Violet le Duc or, or, well, that kind of books, or even the dictionaries of architecture, well, it doesn't seem that that uh, energy is, is a key while obviously what they tell us about architecture has to do with energy and you showed us very much. So were they simply silent about the, the question or uh, did they ignore that a part of their problems, part of their solutions came from energy issues? How do you see that? Yeah, it's a really, Big, important, fascinating question, isn't it? Um, I think I would take a certain degree of exception to the idea that Le Corbusier isn't engaging with it. Mm. When you look at the pictures, he doesn't say much in the text, but when you look at the pictures in Towards an Architecture, 
the um, uh, an extraordinarily large proportion of them are things like a coal yard, a series of motors, um, a ventilation fan. These um, and quite and there are two or three electric generating turbines uh, in the in the course of the book where. He's clearly specifically obsessed, not just with machinery in general, but with machinery related to energy production. Mm. Uh, and I think that, and when you look at the photos of um, his houses, uh, the photos he himself took often include things like the oil tank and the petrol uh, tank for the car underneath, uh, the, um, underneath the villa. Uh, he carefully gets all those pipes and all those tanks in and people don't tend to use those photos as much because they don't set, tell the stories that we want to tell of internal space. They tell stories of uh, that he wanted to tell of energy consumption, uh, but he chose to, he did choose to use that. I agree that the term is very much um, uh, missing in a lot of the discussion, but the, uh, but its implications are not. So again, with, um, uh, with the Futurist Manifesto, uh, the entire um, uh, preamble to it, of the, that story of, um, uh, of um, uh, Santelia and his friends, uh, uh, or Marinetti and his friends rather, uh, uh, staying up all night underneath electric lighting, listening to trams going past with their lights on and their thundering motors, thinking about steamships and the enormous power of their boilers, and then jumping into their petrol powered cars, driving too fast, crashing, and drinking the dirt out of a factory, um, uh, sort of oil spilt into a, um, into a ditch by a factory. It's a kind of, and then fantasizing about his own murder underneath an aeroplane wing in the future. Uh, he is he's very, very deeply wrapped up in engines and ways of transforming fossil fuels into energy, into usable energy. Uh, so I would say that it's there, but it's not usually called energy. So they say mechanization, they say new techniques, they say new materials. And behind all of these is a huge amount of fossil fuel energy input, but they're not framing it in the way that, uh, that I framed it because today we understand the climate change crisis as an energy crisis. And the advantage of energy as a modern framing of it is precisely that it links uh, hunter-gatherer food and firewood uh, to um, uh, renewables now or oil now as the same measurable quantities in a way that if you talk about me mechanization, that story only goes back a relatively short way and isn't nearly so useful. So I think um, it's me that's brought the term energy to bear on these things, but it's not against a kind of, I'm not providing something that they had no interest in, I'm just reframing it in contemporary terms. I think the uh, things like you get, um, the great arts and crafts architect, um, English arts and crafts architect, um, uh, Hugh Mackay Bailey Scott uh, talks about how um, the wonders of coal are that it's ancient sunlight. So in the evening you are getting Jurassic sunlight in your room. So he therefore designs the room around the fireplace and this kind of poetic response to coal is really strong. Um, and you get on the opposite side of that same discussion, Ruskin hating the effects of coal in making people lazy and uh, giving people too many easy options and de-skilling and de-crafting and polluting. And, uh, and they are, they're really, uh, they're really conscious of these issues, but they frame them in 20 different ways that don't necessarily, that, that, that I think the term energy can link back up. Yeah. 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 I, I, I understand. And I, I, I do believe that uh, your position uh, is, is uh, definitely shareable and your words convince me that probably your book, your work is, uh, uh, how could we say, probably the, the early 21st century uh, new updated version of a line which I consider uh, the line of the ancestors of uh, environmental history of architecture, which is uh, the line occupied basically by the two of them, Siegfried Gideon with Mechanization Takes Command and uh, Rainer Banham uh, 
with uh, the architectural well-tempered environment. In fact, they were those who uh, suggested what you said, what you now said explicitly, that whenever architects uh, spoke about machinery, machines, et cetera, et cetera, they actually were speaking of energy. They were speaking of consumption. They were speaking of their domestic envir environment changing because something around was changing. And, and this is definitely evident in that masterpiece, uh, which is Mechanization Takes Command, uh, which I think is one of the seminal books uh, I don't know if you if you if you think that's so uh, for for this kind of studies. Um, this is quite convincing. Well, probably uh, I would also add to this line uh, uh, to this conceptual conceptualization of uh, uh, what could, how could we, could I say energy. Uh, uh, is the other phase of progress. Hmm? Let's say something like that. Uh, probably uh, I found particularly useful uh, some, some pages from another book, which I do love literally, and another British historian uh, with Adrian Forty, much more recent than, than them, which is in Words and Buildings, the chapter about nature. Well, I reread the, the, the chapter about the word nature in, in Adrian's book, and I, I did found, found that uh, uh, probably sometimes, not always, but sometimes when architects talk about, talked about, wrote about nature, well, actually they were speaking about uh, their counterpart what was uh, outside uh, architecture, what was some, somehow fighting against architecture, the, 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 the counter force uh, for architecture. That, that was just a suggestion. And uh, uh, I, I don't know if you, if, you, if, you, if you agree about that, probably sometimes uh, uh, even Quatremer, uh, even uh, when they talk about what is nature, they, they are somehow speaking of what, how nature moves architecture. Yes, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yes, the, um, yes, I think, I think you're, you're right that that's, that, that, um, that picking at the same question via the word nature could potentially get you a slightly different, um, rebalancing of parts of it couldn't it that um uh... because if i may add probably if you if you read the, uh, that word from this other side from your point of view uh well finally the question about uh, environment in architectural history at least skip the major question that for instance in italy always uh, came come comes out when you talk about environment, which is landscape. Mm. Environmental architecture has very little to do with landscape uh, and with the history of landscape, at, at least in 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 the sense uh, um, in the meanings uh, explored by architectural historians. Very very different is when we talk with art historians or with historians like Simon Schama uh, and his landscape. Well, this has much to do with, with these words, but architectural landscape or townscape, well, mm, it's not exactly uh, on our side, I think. I think I, 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 uh, I'm writing my, uh, well, working on in various different ways, still reading and still writing. Uh, my next book at the moment, which is um, the uh, the rest of the story. So um, mm -hmm. the human, the entanglement between culture and uh, energy uh, mm -hmm. throughout human uh, the human past. Um, and the thing that's come out to, from that very strongly to me is that I don't really accept the separation between um, 
uh, humanity and nature. Uh, we're just an extremely um, uh, energy rich species within nature. And uh, there's a continuum. There is no point at which you can sort of say uh, this is the point before which we were living in harmony, because uh, since we've had fire, we've been deliberately reshaping the environment with fire in a way that uh, that I think most contemporary uh, sort of rich world interpretations would see as quite destructive of burning large areas in order to change the patterns of game migration, for example, so that hunting is easier. Uh, there are very few species that don't have either of animal or of plant left on the planet that don't have strategies for recovering after a, after a devastating fire. And that's not primarily from natural fires. It's uh, yeah. according to paleontologists. It's because of us burning everything. Uh, and, uh, and so the things that are still there are the ones that worked out how to, how to regenerate after a fire. Uh, so I think um, we, you could, there's, uh, I can't remember who it is who proposes an Anthropocene that begins with our discovery of fire for that reason. Uh, I've, the, the name of the author slipped out of my head, um, but I really like that as a way of looking at it. And it, to me, it helps with thinking about the present as well, because um, if you have too much of a kind of sense of pristine nature versus corrupt human presence, Firstly, it's a very depressing worldview, uh, but secondly, it doesn't offer easy uh, framings of solutions to a, to a very heavily populated planet. And to me, the aim is to keep as much biodiversity as we can, but not necessarily not to change things. Uh, we clearly need to because we've already changed the climate to the point where we need to help species to migrate. We need to consciously intervene as farmers of the planet in various uh, very, very careful and evidence-led ways uh, that um, recognize the fact that we haven't been uh, dealing with, there's hardly any uh, ecosystems on the planet that aren't already uh, in a complex symbiosis with human beings. And if we want to keep the biodiversity, we don't do that by, by, by getting our hands off. And in the same way, we don't need to feel kind of enormously guilty for what we are. Uh, we just need to try and change enough about how we do things to avoid a, ca a catastrophe for ourselves and for other species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's very, very important. I do agree. Filippo. So, um, we have a number of questions uh, that the students have prepared for Barnabas. So maybe we are now uh, going to start with a few questions. Be before doing that, um, I still have a question coming from the, from the official discussions, let's say, to this conference, but I'm sort of acting as a translator here because I'm translating a question coming from our colleague, uh, Vilma Fazoli, who asked, me, who asked me to translate a question for you. And, uh, the question is interesting because it is a pessimistic one, and uh, I'm pretty sure it is a question you have been confronted with several times. So uh, I'm sort of curious to hear your position on that. Uh, Vilma um, told us that she, she greatly appreciates your book and the eye-opening character of the book, the way in which you use language and images, and especially uh, data, actually numbers, as you were telling, to uh, rewrite, let's say, the history of architecture from a specific point of view. But her sort of pessimistic provocation was, well, but as architects as, uh, or engineers, can we actually do something? And she was referring to Manfredo Tafuri's works, especially Project and Utopia, and his uh, uh, old diagnosis of uh, the, uh, the situation of architect in late capitalism and uh, the fact that the architectural professions was ultimately entangled with the capitalist processes. And uh, how can we find a way to escape from the, or to, 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 um, to reorient the economic and social processes of uh, late capitalism that are somehow, uh, that seem to have been part of the problems that your book is addressing. I'm really curious to hear your position on this, uh, uh, against these potential objections. It's obviously a fantastically important and um, central question to the question of this 
ongoing uh, survival of multicellular life on Earth. Um, I think the thing that's coming most strongly out of my uh, next book is the incredibly tight relationship between human culture and human energy systems. And that can be in the direction of the kind of um, pessimistic view of the present that the path dependencies of our economy and our technical processes are so powerful that we are doomed to continue uh, talking about sustainability but not doing it until we're, it's too late and then we will all uh, work out what to do in the disaster that follows. Uh, however, I've become, I've been partly deliberately searching for examples from any point in human history of systematic cultural choice about self-restraint in energy use. Uh, and particularly uh, the, the places where you see it again and again and again are in agrarian and hunter-gatherer societies where people simply do not wipe out the resources on which they uh, depend uh, with a tiny number of exceptions that tend to be more related to an unforeseen change that um, that was uh, that hit tipping points in a way that was um, locally devastating but as a general rule uh, humans are very good at taking collective cultural uh, positions that change the way uh, that they procure and use energy supplies. So if we start really wanting to solve this, we all think we want to, but actually when it comes to it, it's sort of quite nice to turn the heating up a bit in winter. It's sort of quite nice still to go and travel a bit, even if it's just on trains, it's still, you know, there's still a carbon footprint to that and so on. We're not yet at a point where we truly individually in our hearts really want to stop doing the things we have to stop doing. Uh, and to start doing the things we have to start doing. And this is a tipping, a cultural tipping point question. So if you look at, um, uh, at the past of, for example, the West Coast of uh, the United States before first contact with Europeans, there's a, both an incredibly encouraging and an incredibly discouraging history there of uh, the people living on the Southern coasts um, in what's now California, choosing to uh, subsist largely off lower energy, harder to, to harvest pine nuts as their staple, uh, because they so disliked the patterns of um, uh, warlordism and um, uh, slave holding that the northern coast the, um, of uh, of the northern west coast of, the, of North America uh, had got into via their patterns of salmon fishing. So they fished enormous amounts of migratory fish very, very quickly. And then there was a horrible and very big job gutting them, uh, after which you then had an, an ample food supply. So you use the food supply to feed retainers. You use the retainers to capture, to enslave people from other groups. And then uh, the enslaved people did the horrible job of gutting the salmon and preserving it. And so you get this effective cycle that produces an energy system that the Southerners simply decided they didn't want. And so they did this really impressive cultural opposition to a norm uh, that, that, that I find really uh, fills me with hope that if we want to, we can do this because they genuinely ended up, the two groups genuinely ended up with fundamental emotional and spiritual and heartfelt belief in the rightness of their way of doing things where um, the, uh, but that simultaneously uh, ends up producing a problem where uh, where that same example gives you a sense of the depth of culture war in human capacity. And culture war for me is the biggest danger that as more and more of us tip further and further into really wanting to do the right things to save this situation, uh, the people who refuse to wear masks through the, the worst bits of COVID before there were any vaccines and so on, uh, just to make a point, you know, all those elderly, overweight Republican politicians in America 
who exposed themselves deliberately to COVID to make a polemical point when they were high risk from the disease. Uh, if they're willing to do that, they're certainly also willing to, uh, to continue to resist appropriate climate action. So for me, the challenge isn't the, um, the gradient produced by fossil fuel capitalism, which I think we can decide to resist. It's created by humans and it can be taken apart by humans. The challenge for me is stopping 48% uh, 40, 48 of the rich world's population continuing to actively uh, choose to do the wrong thing deliberately and extravagantly out of um, out of culture war. So that's my that's my uh, slightly long answer to that very very important question. Thank you very much. Uh, one thing I do appreciate in your position is the the kind of role it seems to attribute to architectural history as one of the potential cultural components of a new awareness in, into this kind of, uh, so a sort of mili potentially militant role for architectural history, or at least, well, a sort of public engagement of architectural historians, so for sure. Uh, so I think the time has come from collecting students' questions. I don't know whether we want to collect them one by one or, you know, yeah. so you'll, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for your wonderful lecture. Okay. Sorry. Well, my question is, in one of your article, you say that Adrian Forti claims that reinforced concrete was used by architects to escape from the matter and transcend into the liberty of form of choose the best form. So since nowadays architects are using a lot of innovative materials, can we say that we are moving to a new era where you, when you, you architects, so me, my colleagues, we have the liberty to choose from the form and also the material by using them both to archive the real sustainable with passive standard houses to use the form to benefit from the uh, environment like the sun and the ventilation and also to use the material to trap the heat inside the building or to keep it outside in base of the needs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. I, I think concrete was enormously liber liberating to architecture and was hugely thrilling but actually a lot of that liberation was unnecessary people like Le Corbusier got incredibly excited by the te technical capacities of bridge building and hangar construction and so on but how many building types what proportion of all the world's building requirements are actually for enormous single uh, single spaces and things with very very high engineering demands and for things that aren't like that there are really, really good low energy options. Stone is hyper abundant in Italy, uh, really good quality building stones. Um, the um, reused materials, existing buildings that just need a bit of uh, an environmental upgrade. And you have a much less cold winter than, uh, than we do here. So your upgrades must need to be less extreme to see off the cold winter even now. And when you add two degrees to the temperature plus an urban heat island, then that's probably uh, a fairly negligible requirement. So I think the, uh, I think the incredible inspiration that the 20th century modernist architects got from the freedom of reinforced concrete went into a kind of game of its own that I love aesthetically, but that we don't need to keep doing. We don't need to stand things on legs if they could perfectly well stand on the ground. No one's ever actually done anything under a building on piloti other than take gorgeous photos of the piloti. Uh, the, the concrete is all sparable you just sit the building on the ground uh, and foundations are genuinely difficult and the current regulations and current technical um, uh, and labor and skill bases but it is it, it's been possible in the past to build robust earthquake resistant buildings without concrete and steel uh, we just need to get back to doing that 
and uh, the inspiration, the beauty will come. Humans, right back to that mammoth bone hut uh, that I started my lecture with, have made what they were making anyway unnecessarily beautiful. Uh, they have chosen to uh, align things when they can align, to emphasize things, to color them, to carve them. Uh, we will always find the ways of making beautiful what we have to do, but we have to start by doing the right thing and then find the beauty. Okay, you in the article of terrible battle of architecture have a nice capability to distinguish the three stages of evolution in architectural style. I was asking myself if from the point of view of the research and the creation of Owen's, uh, uh, of Owen's style, uh, since I want to become an architect in the future, um, should I uh, concentrate in you know, a morphological with positive or more useful to focus on the research of materials? Or uh, there must not be this distinction of the two elements uh, go hand in hand with each other? Thank you. That's an excellent question. And uh, uh, I'm very impressed with uh, the two questions so far, having both uh, been based on uh, articles that I wrote a long time ago. So thank you very much for digging them out and looking at them. Um, the, uh, the question of shape and material, I think when you start to really uh, feel the absurdity of our current energy use, they the answers to some of these questions becomes increasingly obvious the more you look at the technical aspects of them. And the two are clearly going to be related that there are limits to the uh, shapes that are possible within certain materials. Uh, but um, those limits can work together with an appropriate massing to achieve uh, the best use of uh, the thermal heat, the solar heat you want, and the best avoidance of the solar heat you want to avoid. Uh, and that, that combination of material and shape seems to me very likely, as a moon architect myself, but it seems to me very likely to come together. The, the, the convincing uh, zero carbon architecture of the near future will manage to find solutions that bring together the material and the shape in ways that uh, may sometimes not be in the first generation of them particularly beautiful and that's fine if not uh, there may be some crudities there may be some things that turn out later to have been blind alleys but the problem at the moment is that uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled you're asking this question because most of the the architectural world is still answering the challenges of the 1990s or so uh, and starting to think about operational energy, but with very little thought for embodied energy uh, and embodied carbon. Uh, and trying to, you know, once you start asking these questions, how can I cut the embodied carbon and how can I cut the operational carbon to as close to zero as I can get? Are there materials I could use that would actually sequester carbon, take it out of the atmosphere and put it into the building as a building material? Uh, those questions quickly, because they're being asked by lots of people at the moment, particularly young architects uh, and architecture students, the answers, you're not alone in trying to answer them. Feel free to copy really good ideas, give credit for them, but copy them. That's how progress is made. You copy and refine what other people have done really well. That's how technical progress is achieved. Uh, and I think um, uh, that they are inextricable. Shape and shape and material are architecture between them. Thank you. Good afternoon. In your book, Architecture from Prehistory to Climate Emergency, you change your uh, viewpoint 
from a more traditional chronological categorization to an energy, energy consumption categorization. My question is, how um, did you make this transition uh, coming from studying brutalism to studying energy consumption throughout history? Did you have some sort of illumination during researches or was it more like gradual shift uh, uh, to this topic? Uh, thank you. That's a really uh, a nice question. Um, I was asked to write a, a kind of introductory uh, book on architecture, uh, where, which would you know, serve as a kind of first thing you could read before you would then go off and read things of more specialism. Um, and I was trying to think what would make, I, I fundamentally believe in the illuminating power of history. And so I was always going to make it historical. And I was trying to think of contemporary issues that might uh, shed interesting light backwards. And I thought, well, the biggest issue we face is energy. Let's see whether that has any kind of um, resonance uh, in earlier times. So I decided to look at the energy consumption required for the biggest building uh, in the ancient world, which is the Pyramid of Khufu that I showed in the lecture. And having discovered that it was only, uh, it was something like half the energy consumption of um, uh, a medium sized university building in it, that had just gone up in America uh, during the 60 year expected lifespan, including construction and demolition of this tiny building compared with the, the Pyramid of Khufu. I thought, right, okay, this is, this is really, really big uh, as, a, as a surprise. And so I started reading energy history and from then it was like uh, a light bulb going on and I couldn't stop, my, you know, I would be walking down a street with a child in a pram staring at the chimney pots and thinking about terracotta <laughs> because uh, uh, just everything suddenly started to, to whir. Um, and because the question is so simple, uh, it then kind of, shows you what to do next it all it's it's in a way it, it was in practical terms a difficult book to research because finding the, the information I needed was difficult but in intellectual terms it was an incredibly easy book to research uh, because uh, to write because uh, it's such a simple question uh, but yeah uh, I've been a kind of like some uh, new convert to a religion I have been uh, talking to anyone who will listen about this ever since then. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Kelder, and good afternoon. I have a more specific question than my friends. I was wondering if you can change the scope from chapter nine into chapter three, where you were investigating the Roman Empire and economic booms. I was wondering, according to your idea, and after I will ask why, which has a more influence compared to the in unparalleled energy resources? You think the feeding the workforce or division of the labor? That you can't detach the two, I don't think. The, um, if you have a small workforce, you don't provide labor. And if you have a big workforce, you do. So uh, the division of labor uh, rises. Uh, there's no, I don't have any way of plotting this on a graph, but anecdotally, I would say that if you could find a way of plotting number of building specialists against amount of energy in a society, you would end up seeing that the curve followed very, very neatly. Because uh, one of the things I was so struck by is the extreme similarity of some of the measures in Song Dynasty China, uh, you know, a thousand years later, um, and uh, culturally in a very different context uh, to in um, Imperial Rome. Uh, when both of them have a very rapid increase in energy uh, input and they, um, and they both therefore have a building boom and they both uh, systematize and work out ways of expanding the labor force very rapidly and specialize down uh, and break the power of, um, of uh, secret specialism in building by writing it up and by consciously training people, training unskilled people to produce buildings to a high quality. So I think it's, um, uh, I think there's an extraordinary extent to which if you put similar energy changes into, into slightly similar societies, you very often see extraordinarily similar outputs. 
Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Another excellent question. These are great. Okay. Thank you very much, Barnabas. Uh, I think the end of, uh, of our time today is approaching. I don't know whether there is any further. We, we may have time for one additional question from the room if anyone wants to, to pose it. Is there anyone? No, from apart from the chat. Uh, or in the chat, exactly, for those that are connected. I, I was just curious, but it, it is. Uh, a very quick question, but uh, I was curious to hear how do you uh, relate this book and this adventure, let's say, um, to your previous research on post-war architecture, whether you see this as a sea change and you're sort of refusing to talk about what you did before, or whether there is some uh, uh, closer connection actually to that somehow holds together your, um, um, your trajectory, let's say, in architectural research. Um, I think I realized as I, I came to the energy idea for this book as I was finishing the previous book. And so I was just in time to write it into the introduction of that book that essentially what I suddenly realized I'd been looking at all that time. My, my initial enthusiasm for post-war architecture came from the fact that I liked it and most people at the time didn't. Uh, and therefore um, I then spent years uh, trying to persuade people to give it a, another chance, which is a fairly lowbrow uh, project. <laughs> I did some decent history on the way. Um, and uh, the, uh, at the end of that book process, I suddenly came to this realization about energy and realized that one of the things that brutalism was, was a kind of orgiastic moment of huge excitement uh, technical possibilities brought about by fossil fuels and coming to engineering maturity in that period after the Second World War. So concrete steel and uh, sophisticated servicing are all really, really good by 1950, say. And you then get uh, a burst of architecture that uh, is the architectural equivalent of that moment in the early 19th century when um, Victorian, uh, uh, English Victorian people like um, Dickens and Pugin just suddenly burst into a level of productivity that the world had never seen before because they could get around on trains so fast and it didn't occur to them to get tired. They just threw themselves into it. And brutalism did that a bit for, a, for architectural style that they're just has this incredible liberation and they try everything in very quick bursts of this enormous worldwide building boom, uh, all networked by um, the fossil fuel driven uh, international media. Uh, so I think it's ended up, I en I've ended up seeing that material through this light, uh, both as a, I suppose in three ways, one as a cautionary tale that we're still doing most of the things they did that we mustn't be doing so using masses of concrete steel and servicing and uh, secondly that um, that it's kind of how I understand the glory of that period is that it's such a celebration of these new capabilities and thirdly that that original desire to make people stop hating this stuff and pulling it down has also acquired a kind of additional importance from the fact that the embodied carbon in those buildings and the carbon cost of replacing them is enormous and therefore keeping them and loving them as they are and retrofitting them enough to mean that they perform much better and require less energy input now operationally uh, those all seem to me to be uh, things that I feel very strongly from that period so I haven't given up on it my uh, Complete works of Lasden, which has been promised since about um, uh, 2005, uh, is still in the pipeline, uh, and I, it will now be a complete works of Lasden, understood partly through the lens of energy change, because I can't understand anything not through the lens of energy change anymore. Uh, but uh, it will be nevertheless a complete works that uh, lists all his buildings and says a few uh, necessary things about all of them, other than just you know. Look at the servicing. <laughs> so we were even more curious to see this work. Yeah. Than, I guess. <laughs>
So thank you very much, Barnabas, for a fantastic uh, conference and also for your reaction to the to the questions that you got. It was a very interesting discussion, I guess. Uh, I leave Sergio the task to to have a uh, concluding. This. No, just just uh, just a, a deep, deep, deep thank to to Barnabas because it was really uh, what 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 uh, what everybody should imagine to be a, a lecture that is someone who talk who talks and then uh, some new topics, new issues that come in front of us in mind and help discussion and open open new visions, etc. So thank you very much for making us uh, uh, reflecting on, on energy and architecture in this, for, for us, uh, difficult energy turn <laughs> with, the, with the history of architecture. And uh, thank you for your uh, extreme, uh, uh, extreme kindness and also for your clarity. I mean, what Filippo said about militant history of architecture, well, uh, probably uh, we have some kind of lost this potentiality. We, we always think that probably uh, studying Renaissance architecture or studying uh, Art Nouveau architects uh, is just a question of academics. While it is not, well, we, we tend to forget that. Uh, we tend to forget that mm, Dennis Lasden can be uh, an extremely political issue, even, mm, even him. And, uh, and thank you for reminding us. And finally, thank, thank you very much for, uh, to me, as a, as a, as a humble, architecture historians working on the 19th century for having a lecture, having on your back that wonderful William Morris strawberry thief <laughs> wallpaper, which is the sign that sometimes architecture uh, remains beyond any kind of definition of pioneers or whatever. Uh, it remains splendid and that's it. Uh, Thank you, Barnabas. Thank you. We hope to see you in Italy uh, sometimes, maybe for your for the translation of your book. We 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 would very very much like to invite you again and this time in person, live, with your daughter. Why not? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you. Wonderful question. Thank you very much to you. Thank you very much and uh, see you next time. Okay? I'll go and bye see bye. how I Thank you. Goodbye. Grazie Filippo, grazie ragazzi. Grazie Ciao. mille.